Vancouver since 2002, pretty much every year there for a long time, more frequently than that, but now it's coming on an annual basis here. Uh, Dr. Lengdo <coughs> is originally from Vienna, has a doctorate in, in medicine and doctorate in psychology, worked for quite a long time with Viktor Frankl there, who I think most everybody would know here, uh, co-founded the Society for Logotherapy and Existential Analysis there and was a long time president of the International Society there. Um, he uh, comes to us on a great, regularly, he's here actually doing training and doing psychotherapy training in existential analysis with our cohorts here, but he's here tonight to give a lecture on something that we maybe feel very confused about when we encounter it there, which is the topic of hysteria there. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to, it's such a helpful perspective that existential analysis is able to shed on this, and so I ask you to welcome with me Dr. Alfred Lengda. several times for seminars years ago, almost two decades ago. Already. And <clears throat> yeah. And so it is somehow a coming back uh, to a ground which I'm a bit familiar and I feel a bit at home here since this experience before. <clears throat> Today I'm the uh, chose a theme which is not so easy and which is in high discussion in the field of psychology because hysteria in this form doesn't exist uh, in, in the manuals as exists in diet or depression. Hysteria is a, very, is a, a term which has a long history a, a, myth of background and um, describes a picture which is very changeable and very fluctuating. And um, what, why we decided to bring it is to give you an, uh, an understanding of the common ground of the whole suffering and pathology which is combined with hysteria, before it is um, divided into different um, diagnoses or pathologies. In this group belong all the, or many like personality disorders, like the histrionic personality disorder, the, the narcissist, the, the borderline, the, even the paranoid, or the antisocial personality disorder and also the, the neurotic development and the, the, um, the somatoform disorders. And so hysteria appears in many different pictures and therefore it is very difficult to grasp. And in existential analysis, we choose a phenomenological approach to, to the human being and to the human suffering. And with this phenomenological approach, we can bring out the, something essential of what, or, or common denominators, or a nucleus of what this pain, this suffering, these uh, pathologies consist of. And this is not a very usual approach. It's few psychotherapists use phenomenology to such an extent as we do, and, but it is very valuable, and so we thought, to make you a bit um, better understandable, accessible, this form of disease, and to <coughs> yeah, empathize, okay. may empathize a bit more, and at the end, to know how to, to deal better with these difficult suffering, which is hysteria. 
So I'm going to through several steps to depict, to design the, uh, the picture from symptomatology to the, to the nucleus of the development and then at the end to give you some ideas of prevention and of dealing with people who are suffering from uh, hysteria. I will give little hints for therapy but mostly for the dealing with uh, this picture in everyday life, because this is the way how most people have to deal with hysteria. When we speak about hysteria, we, we encounter a difficult term, because we often say, don't be so hysteric, and we mean it in a uh, evaluating way. And um, we don't take really very seriously the hysteria because uh, they are so exaggerating and they are so <coughs> difficult to talk with. And so we have a, a, a prejudice maybe or primary impression of hysteria which is not very pleasant. And, uh, but we have to know and I want to put it at the beginning that hysteria is a real suffering. It is so painful. It is a suffering which is as severe as anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and sometimes even. It is a suffering which has, which arises from the background of the person who did not, or the individual, who did not find himself or herself, who is alien for oneself, who is not knowing who I am. This, of course, is a difficult question for everybody. Who knows who I am? Who is me? What is really me? On what is it grounded? What is the nucleus of it? What is the true self? This is not so easy to know. And we can experience that in different life situations, we are more or less ourselves, that we can lose ourselves, that we sometimes see what we did and it appears to us as being foreign. This has to be me, I, I can't imagine, I can't identify myself. And so we all know a little bit of this search of ourselves. This constant striving for coming closer to myself, for being more myself, for, for being in touch with myself. Because sometimes we lose ourselves become so irritated or curious that we, we aren't anymore ourselves. And in hysteria, this, you have, we find a constant loss of oneself, of the true self. Of course, they have a kind of identity. Of course, they know who they are. They know their names, they are schizophrenic, they are realistic. But really, who am I really? This is something which the hysteric doesn't find. And he finds solutions. Solutions which have the same tendency as in the healthy human being. The same tendency as children to become ourselves. How does this happen? This happens by encountering. We need the other people. We need other persons. We need parents, friends, teachers who see us, who encounter us, who speak to us, who try to understand us, who look at us and look at, in a, look at us in a way that uh, they can, that they try to see who I really am and give us feedback in the way how they behave. They, they 
children always claim attention of the parents when they are three or four. Daddy, look at me. Mom, look at me. What I did, what I can. They need attention. And by this attention, they find out more and more who they are. Hysteric people do the same, like children. And they are a little bit like children, a little bit immature, quite a lot of immature. Sport. Look at me, like children. This is the same tendency which have the children. So hysterics, hysteric people do the same, what children do, because they, they feel that they have no access to themselves, and they feel they need the other people for them. They need them out. But at the same time, they <coughs> cannot absorb what other people give them. They are blocked inward. They have uh, there's too much pain. So this makes it difficult. They, uh, they involve the environment, they involve other, other people, which is effort taking for other people, and does not lead to a good resolution of the problem. Because the natural development, as happens in children, cannot take place in the adults, in the, in the hysteric, hysteronic or hysteric people. Histrionic is the Latin word, and hysteric people is the Greek. Hysteric is the Greek term. I will say a bit more on hysteric meaning. So we see in histrionism, this is a suffering of a blocked development to become more myself. It's suffering where people do not know, not feel who they are, have no access to their essence, to their inner person, to their true self, or however you want to call it. It is an existential theme. I cannot be really myself. I feel I need the other, but I don't reach the other, or the other don't reach me. It's frustration, it's pain, and but a constant striving for it. The, the place where histrionic suffering um, shows up is always in the relationship to others, in the public, in with it, when they meet other people, when they are alone. They are very quiet, very lost, and most of them, almost most of these disorders related to histrionism cannot be alone. Because when they are alone, they feel totally empty, totally lost. When they are in the midst of other people, they feel better, but cannot cure them. So the central problem is they need encounter, they need to be seen, but cannot be seen anymore because it's too painful. It's too, there's a blockage in there. Where does this name come from? Hysteria. This is uh, hysteria, he hysteria, is the Greek word for uterus. So it is combined in the traditional thinking, in the myth, with the uterus. And there's a, a very old uh, idea which comes, out, comes from Egypt and came to Greece. <coughs> and Hippocrates taught it. And it was Plato who wrote it down in a dialogue. It is, the idea was that the uterus can go out of the pelvis and walk around in the body. 
and produce disorders of vision, of uh, produce stiff neck, paralyzed, paralyzations. But why is the uterus in this old ancient imagination so mobile? and so <laughs> flexible and so active. Plato wrote, well, <clears throat> the uterus is an animal which desires fervently for children. Of course, this is the nature of the uterus. The uterus is built for having children. If the uterus remains after puberty for a long time infertile, it enriches, walks through the whole body, congests the airways, blocks the breathing, and thus pushes the body into the greatest dangers and produces all sorts of diseases. Until eventually, desire unites man and woman in life. It's a nice story. <laughs> you can imagine when we are united in love. This gives peace, and this is brings happiness, and then the uterus can be quiet again. <laughs> what is this myth telling us? This myth contains a lot of important elements which are valuable until now. If we can read such a list, we get a lot of information. It says that there is an unstable search, a continuous search, a desire, a longing, uh, which comes out of the center of the body. The, the myths in the midst of my body, there is the uterus. Some of this And the uterus, this center of the human being, starts to become um, moving, uh, restless, because it is empty. This is very central in a very good description. The empty center. And out of this emptiness, this emptiness is not <coughs> bearable. And therefore, they are, there starts a searching. A searching which goes over the limits. The uterus doesn't remain in, in its, on its place. It goes into areas where it doesn't belong. And when, we, when things go into areas which are not their areas, they become painful, obstructive, uh, produce symptoms. This transgression of borders out of an empty, inner emptiness is very typical. And the uterus is uh, an organ which has to do with sexuality. And hysteria has very close relationship with sexuality. So also this notion is in the, in the picture. And the notion is in the picture that hysteria can produce so many different symptoms and so changing symptoms that it is very hard to describe. And in the way how we describe nowadays uh, psychological disorders by taxation of symptoms and norms, hysteria is breaking these boundaries and therefore it cannot be described in the way as we describe other disorders. And therefore it is almost it disappeared in our uh, in, in our mindbooks because it's not statistically proof. Nevertheless, when you have a phenomenological approach, then you can find the stability in the picture. 
<coughs> despite the marriage. So, this was a very early description of a disorder which was originally uh, restricted to women. In men, there is not, not such an organ like the uterus. This is one, I, one reason why it was connected with women. And another reason was that women, um, in former times, up to now, um, suffer a bit more often from this disorder because of the repression that they not taking them seriously of the social role. And therefore it was observed more often in women. The early development of psychotherapy, Brauer and Freud in Vienna, um, made their development and their, their investigations on uh, hysteria. The first famous case on hysteria which was described uh, by Breuer together with Freud was the case of Anna O. They published him the case together in 1895. <coughs> this was the first co consistent description of hysteria. <coughs> and Freud continued uh, to describe and to investigate and to develop psychotherapy along with, uh, alongside with the hysteria is the next case which he described at all. This was the case of Dora, very famous case <coughs> in 1901. And um, Freud brought up the idea and described in these cases that in and in each case of hysteria, there is an underlying experience or several experiences of premature sexual experience. Nowadays, this is a, a very important uh, uh, issue again, the sexual abuse. And Freud at that time had this idea that sexual abuse is often the case for the development of uh, of histrionic behavior. He gave up that idea two decades later, and this was a bit of tragic uh, situation in the development of psychotherapy because giving up this idea uh, held to this close to high the, the potentiality of sexual abuse, and it, Freud said that when we talk about this, it is mostly a fantasy and not reality. At the beginning of his research, he said that it is reality, but then he gave it up. It is not known exactly why Freud did it, mainly because he had by himself something like this, some experience like this. This is the idea of what we say about it. Freud, we know from Freud that he destroyed uh, most information about his own life because he didn't want the people later on to know so much about him. And this, all this together gives the idea. So this is a bit a tragic situation. But <clears throat> so we know now that um, there is a suffering which has to do with the center of myself. The, 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 the inner life seems to be empty, is experienced as being empty, and this is unbearable, and this makes, them, makes people crazy and makes them move because they need something where they can detect themselves and find themselves and encounter themselves. So let us come to a description of uh, what is, uh, how it appears, this, uh, how the hysteria appears. The <coughs> strenuous 
of hysteria, when we have to do with people who are hysteric, hysteric they attract attention, constantly attention. They give the, the message, they send out the message, look at me, but don't see me, don't really see who I am. But look at me. But if you look at me, then they hide themselves. This is paradoxical. And we can we will see that in this theory you have always this paradox, this uh, opposites, oppositions. They do something in me in the country or vice versa. There is always a split. This is not logic. Look at me means look who I am. This is what they need, but then the, the suffering comes up and say, look at me. But if you really see who I am, you wouldn't love, love me anymore. You couldn't love me. You, if, you would, if you really see who I am, you would reject me. You would evaluate me. You would possibly hurt me again. And I have this experience. And this cannot happen again. But on the other side, I need you, otherwise I cannot get you. So look at me, but don't see me. And this makes people crazy. This makes all of us crazy when we, when we get to experience them. So this is a double message, double bind. <coughs> Faith. Yeah, and also, they try to attract uh, the attention by showing themselves, not giving themselves, but showing, they are active. They show themselves in a way how they think that other people would accept it, or could be impressed, or would continue to look at them. So they cannot show themselves because they have no access to themselves. They look around and look at what is, what <coughs> people, to what do people react? What is attractive for them? What is interesting for them? And like a chameleon, they change into them and give, show themselves in that way which what is fashionable, what is, uh, in, what is in the mode, what is in, in, in fashion, I'm sorry, and, and what is uh, attractive and interesting for people. <clears throat> they have a constant uh, splitting, experiencing and behavior, which is symptomatic in many areas of their life. They change themes. They use a lot of words and say nothing. Again, you have a great appearance with nothing. They are like a flea, and it is uh, effort taking to follow them. They, well, it had, for, the, for the listener, it happens regularly that we feed the children, we listen, and after a minute, two, or maybe five minutes, we experience that we are distracted. We, we do so as if we still listen, but inwardly we are not listening anymore. We are thinking at something else. We cannot grasp it. It's like popcorn, you eat and eat. There's nothing in me. <laughs> and we often, we often can experience quite quickly a, a tiredness, a even paralyzing tiredness in this. The content and the emotions or the feelings do not go together. There is a contextual dissociation. Uh, the hysteric can, for instance, relate with 
smiling or even laughing that last night my husband hit me and uh, it was a terrible night and ha ha ha. Dissociate. It doesn't go together. There is always this split. They think in black and white. Something is, today it is extremely good, awesome, and tomorrow it's nothing. It's rubbish. It's, uh, they, they do not say what is the truth. They say what impacts, what matters to others. And they um, turn around the reality so that it fits to what the other, what attracts the attention of people. And nothing really touches them. They can laugh, and a minute later they can cry, and a minute later they laugh again. It, for the outside, it is difficult to follow. And they, and we can feel a mightiness in them. They uh, are manipulated. They press us into that understanding we have got to stay here. They want the reality to be a stable. And they make pressure. They override. Uh, they override uh, the listener. They put their ideas on the top of the others. They uh, are smarter than they uh, are reproaching. They are, but at the same time, they are very skillful. They have, uh, everything is doable for them. There's no real problem. And they are very skillful. They are very quick and, and flexible. Adaptable. And they do not know borders. The borders do not exist for them. For instance, sitting in a restaurant, getting the, the food, the hysteric music, oh, these are beautiful fries. Uh, uh, let me taste it. And they already have it in their hand and eat it. It's so, it, it is so astonishing for others that it makes makes other people insecure to say, am I too narrow? This is so he or she does it so naturally and it, it, it seems to be normal. But uh, uh, for me it, it, it makes me it gives me a bad feeling, but maybe we have self doubts in the presence of such person. Maybe this is the natural way, this is the good way, this is a free life. And I am too narrowly educated or too uh, fixed in my mind. It is so self understandable how they behave in their way and so quick, and one feels overrun. Uh, and they are always judging. Uh, Without feeling, there is no experience, a felt experience. They always have, a, have an opinion, very quickly. They are the quickest in having an opinion about something, about what is fashionable, or what is good, or what is the best wine, or what is, uh, about every person, or collaborators, or friends. But this, this is a judging behavior. And they are exaggerated. They speak in, uh, in big, they big uh, numbers. I called you yesterday a thousand times. What are you doing? And they call it one, maybe two times. This impressionistic way of speaking. This was a beautiful concept. Really, what was so 
what did they play? Uh, it doesn't matter. It was extremely good. Uh, but what was so extremely good? Oh, it was everything. Mm -hmm. This is impressionistic. They, they cannot connect it with the concrete, uh, concrete contents. They want to impress the other, but cannot refer to the, the, the details or the, the, or the concrete contents are too narrow for them. They take them away the freedom. Therefore, they, uh, they speak, a, they pro try to produce the, an impression. That's the only thing they want. They don't, do not want to really speak about the thing. They want to have, to make an impression. They are impatient. They cannot wait. They cannot support emptiness. They cannot support pressure from the world. They are never guilty. They try to adapt the world to their, that what they imagine from what they need, what is important. And they are not manipulative by that. They are moody. And they are entangling other people. What are the lines in this behavior? When we look at these these symptoms, at this what appears out of this drug. We can condense it and find there is a central motive in it. The central motive is the search for freedom. They want absolutely to be free. We all want to. And to be free corresponds to the essence of the human being. As persons, we are free. They are in the search of their truth. They are in the search of their essence of being. And the essence is to, to be free. So they are on the right way, but they cannot reach the goal. They start in the right direction. And they try to be free mainly by two um, activities. The first is the uh, lack of relationship. The second is the lack of boundaries. When I'm not related in the sense of attached, but just related for the moment and then I lose the relationship, then I feel free. There is no task no, um, not, no expectation which I have to fulfill. I'm independent. For them, relationship must be independent.
they live a part of freedom. Freedom has two components. Freedom is, on the one side, a freedom from, and on the other side, a freedom for. Freedom from makes me free by uh, dissolving the inculation. I, I, I mean, I'm not dependent. Then I'm free from my parents, for instance. When I'm not dependent, I can quit a job. Then I'm free from it. But this setting me free needs a correspondence. And the meaning of this being free from is to invest it somewhere else or to somewhere to be free for something. This is then this brings freedom to its accomplishment. When I can spend it for something value. And then I connect myself. I bind myself. <coughs> Hysterics have all this half of the freedom to be free from. And never to get connected or problem. Free for is for them like an a prison, a cage. Because then I cannot follow my impulses. And so they have a fear of attachment. And they live in, in almost in a distance. They imply distance. They cannot support closeness. Because closeness is too narrowing, too hurting. This, um, this living in a constant distance in relationship produces a counter-reaction. The counter-reaction is producing effect. Instead of relating, they uh, imply a surrogate which is having effect, seeing, being impressive for others. And therefore, they, they try to be seducing. They uh, have to give appeals. They are claiming they are erotic. Er, erotic Whatever gives them a, gives them an, an impression of others is useful. So they have a feeling of having some <coughs> closeness, but it's not real closeness. But they are close together when they see that they impress people. In reality, they are close. But not living a relationship. The other, the other way how they live uh, freedom is they uh, blow all limitations, all borders. Borders are narrowing your life. Borders are taking away the freedom. When when I subject myself to, to borders, to laws, to regulations, uh, whatever, I'm cutting away my freedom. I'm reducing my freedom. I'm following the idea of others, of the society, maybe, or of the family of the pattern. So borders are unbearable. And they do it in many different ways. They can do it to, to uh, undergo the border, or evade the borders by being charming, flattering, seducing, uh, nice, 
or they can become very uh, cold and overriding, uh, aggressive. And so, uh, whatever the mean is, the idea is, the central great idea behind is, I must be free. <coughs> but because this freedom is a replacement, a, a substitution of the real freedom, this freedom is producing a feeling lost. They feel lost. They are, have a kind of freedom from, but this freedom is, is one sided. This freedom lacks the other one. And they, therefore, they cannot hug, they cannot embrace reality. And so they feel detached, <coughs> low. They do so much and do not come, do not reach a real goal. And instead of having a relationship, they make the other a public to them. They always need public. They have no friends, they always have public. Which they can impress. Therefore, we have this Latin description of histrionic also which says uh, his, uh, his, the histrionic histrio in Latin means uh, actor they are actors they are actors of their own existence they do not live their life we all have tendencies towards it because what is very people do and look for is uh, to become more themselves. And this is something we are on, on track during our whole life. Every day again we have to find ourselves, to meet ourselves, to, to be in contact with ourselves. And one day we are more, one day we are less. So there are tendencies in every human being which go into this direction. For instance, it's very normal uh, to care for, for oneself, to look at oneself, to be occupied with oneself, to have a self-involvement. A healthy egoism, it's a bad word, this kind of uh, being in the center of attention for oneself. And so we, we dress ourselves nicely when we go out and we come to hair, makeup, etc. And we dress it more or less following the f actual fashion. This is not really what comes from ourselves, but this is a, a compliment to the society to, that I say, okay, I adapt a bit to what is fashion. So that you may also look at me and not turn around and see. This is not histrionic, this is very healthy. But in histrionic people, this tendency is much stronger. They, uh, they try to do too much that people uh, not only give attention, but that they stare at them, that they cannot turn away from them. Historic people who do too much for their outfit, with dressing, with uh, colors in the face. You know, every woman knows what is a good level and what becomes too much at the historic. No, has no no limitations. They do too much in everything. They are. <coughs> it is very normal to be extrovert to a certain degree. That I can go out of myself, and speak with others, and be sociable, and, and uh, be 
don't want to be alone all the time, we sometimes look for other people and so on. But when it becomes dominating, it is history. I'm bringing these elements to, to connect this suffering with ourselves. We, we have, this is so human what happens in history. But it's so perfect. And it is so so natural to to be a dynamic personality, to be to, to be creative, active, uh, uh, full of power, but when it becomes restless, when it becomes hysterical, when this power becomes uh, insisting, then it becomes, it goes into the hysterical. Spontaneity, inclusivity. It's good to have a spontaneous idea and you say, oh, tonight, let's go to the cinema. It wasn't planned, but it, uh, to, be, uh, to have a bit of flexibility. Otherwise, life becomes too rigid. And, but when every day and every evening it's always spontaneous or impossible, <coughs> it's too much. Or the cookies. To, to be able to react quickly, it's very human. But when it becomes impatient, pushing, then the presence to live in the here and now. This is very important that we can do that, that we can really hmm, give our attention to what is going on right now. But the historic only lives in the right now, in the moment. It's a moment personality. It's like a child who uh, forgets everything when the child is playing in the same uh, box. To have, to be able to organize, to, to give shape to things, to, to have an aesthetic uh, capacity, is very human. But when they are and it's only nice when we can see it is it is made, it is artificial, then it becomes too much again. But to have an instinct and antenna for what is going on is good if you have. It. But in the histrionic it becomes a hypersensitivity they feel exactly what other people could need and want, and they have no counterpart in them. We all want to be free, but the Islamic wants to be free only in the sense of independence. I describe to you the hysteric behavior is it in a general way, and I can be connected it now with tendencies which we all know. But there are specific symptoms which uh, can be described and which gives the way to the diagnosis. <coughs> the hysteric or hysteric uh, neurosis or suffering has two sides where it shows up. The one is the body and the other one is the consciousness. The body symptoms are so diverse, so manifold. They can relate to the sensory system. All five senses can be disturbed. They, the, they can lose the capacity to feel pain in the body, the analgesia. Um, they can have hyper reactions in, 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 sen in the sensory system. They can taste too much or nothing. They can lose the taste for 
a week or two or a month or three months and then it comes back. They can have visual disorders, acoustic disorders, etc. And it can affect the motoric system. That they uh, lose the voice, that they have paralysis, that they have tics, that they have peripherospasms, that they have cramps, that they have uh, all forms of cramps, of uh, crying cramps or, or shouting cramps, they have tremor, they have chore choreatic disorders, um, they have disorders of the inner organs, they can have uh, vomiting or diarrhea, <coughs> asthma, nervous asthma, tachycardia, allergies, hyperventilation. They can um, have bleeding, fever, eczema. They can have big, great attacks of the neural psychic system. Then we have the great hysteronic attacks, which is similar to epilepsy. It is not so easy to differentiate. <coughs> really, uh, we see from the, what, what, how they can move the body. They have, of course, this emotional liability. They are suggestible. They are, uh, they are always trying to stand in the center of attention, egocentric, affected. They can lose memory. They can deny and say, I didn't say that. But the whole group said, yes, you are right. No, I didn't say that. And say, say, they believe it, and it is their reality. It's not, they are not lying. And they can have uh, a dosis state, a psychic dosis state. They are like absent. They are there. And have this indifference. Freud called it la belle indifference, the nice indifference of this histrionic. I'm always impressed by uh, this connection of psyche and body, which we can observe in histrionic uh, disorders most closely, because they change so many symptoms. And when they are in attention and they have a psychic problem, they have fever, or an eczema, or diarrhea. Of course, functional disorders like headache, or muscle cramps, or so or paralysis, they cannot walk, they cannot move the arm. Under hypnosis, they can move. <coughs> Neurologically, it's okay. So close is body and psyche connected. Yeah, behind these, uh, these symptoms, concerning body, all organs of the, of the body and concerning the consciousness, the indifference, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the special way of like sleeping, being awake and sleeping. So it can happen. There are uh, special lines behind There is, for instance, one line is there is always too much and too little, as an expression of the lack of the inner, of the center, of the middle. They have, they can have react very calmly, very without affect, without feelings. And on the other side, they can be effusive, affected. I'd say, hello, I didn't see you so long. And at the end of the meeting, they can go away without saying anything. 
butterflies who come from time to time, uh, disgusting, what they call these little worms, the Germans are all the caterpillar. Caterpillar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, another line behind mm -hmm. this, uh, these symptoms is the externalization. They find themselves in the outer world. The outer world is representing them. The own myth is in the outside. And so they do a lot for the external life. They transfer their feelings or affects on other people. They delegate them. They are uh, uh, adapting to the outer world in a way that they are seen. They make use of the outer world. And so they are abusing the outer world always for their own sake. Therefore, histrionic uh, symptomatology has a great changeableness. Each time has their histrionic symptoms. Nowadays, we have a time where pain is impacting us. And so we have all different forms of pain as main symptoms. And a uh, hundred years ago, it was the, the, the fainting which was so impressive. And it was shit for a woman to faint in the, the body. <laughs> and men had little uh, um, bottles of uh, kind of perfume, every man at that time, which they gave to the lady and the lady was excited and so amazing. It was the reunion in love. <coughs> These are his, uh, historic realities. So this is not an invention. This is always combined with hysteria. So hysteria has a lot of changes and is always the thermometer of the society. Hysteria is a, an externalized life. They when they come, they appear. They try to impress. But this should not hide the deeper feeling. Hysteric head in general, when we have the new therapy, it comes out sooner or later. They have a, a basic feeling of themselves, kind of a feeling. This basic feeling is, I am wrong. I'm not right. I shouldn't be that way. They have that. But they can't understand it. They can't do anything. We all sometimes have a feeling that maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not. But they have it constantly. And it's somehow a little realistic. What can we experience when we are together with hysteric people? Or what do they themselves experience? There's a chain of experiences. On the one side, we always have two sides in history. On the one side, they are animated. They are dynamic. There is a lot of movement. Of flexibility of changing of ideas. Life, this is animated. And this produces a feeling of freedom. We can feel that, that with them we, we can start to fly. We, we, have, we detect new horizons. We feel inspired. We lose our vinculations and our boundaries a bit. And this can can go further and uh, thrill us, inspire us, mesmerize us, and produce a feeling of happiness. And we can be with hysteric people like in heaven. 
this is the one side. But the other side is that they are, uh, they can bug, irritate, driving, driving us crazy. Because everything is too much, is manipulated, is empty, is void. And we can feel narrow by their uh, pressure, by their loneliness, by their abusive behavior. This can uh, it become stronger, and then we get feelings of um, nausea. We feel uh, not validated, overridden, not taken seriously. It is so painful how they change and how they are healed in a way, etc. And the strongest feeling what we can get out of what they can get for themselves also is disgust. They are nauseous, insolent, gruesome, impertinent. Love some guys, and you can feel like you will. So, in the extreme, and from the outside, people react mostly in the way that one side is the dynamic which we take over. Uh, this fascination, this going along with them, this uh, uh, we cannot escape, we stick on them. And the danger, of course, is that they are entangling us. After a while, or yeah, when we have experiences, most people are in the middle stage. They uh, produce defense, they are angry, they are attentive, they refuse themselves, they do not, do not take them seriously, seriously any longer. They are becoming unwilling and they may even terminate the relationship. The strongest reaction is that when his terrorism becomes threatening, then he are uh, in the attitude in the mode of protection, of withdrawing, of resigning. It can become so strong that we feel paralyzed and fall into a facility and do not stop them anymore, letting them do what they like and get hurt more and more. Is there a a few words on the capacities? They are specialists of effects. They are charming. They are uh, attaching. They can be breathtaking. They can be ingenious. and music and from the point of view of relationship they are socially uh, very uh, easy care easy care I think well, well, uh, have uh, a low maintenance as they call themselves they are not a heavy they, they do not have a wedding so that it's so flexible and adaptable. They can have a very good relationship with small children or some with a bit older children, but with children they can do it better than with adults in general. And their behavior, they are very skillful, flexible, um, 
they can do all kinds of, of things if they are quick, if they are thoughtful, attentive, even preemptive. They, are, they have a tenacity. They are full of verve. They are until becoming even penetrating. If they are universalists, because they can do, they know everything about everything, but as amateurs, they know nothing concretely, nothing in depth. They know a hundred things a little bit. Complexity is not a problem for them. They can be extremely good with complexity, reduce it. They are good beginners. But the danger is the case, <coughs> when it, because they can do too much at the same time, and then they become killed. If they have a great gift for creativity, for the form, for the aesthetic, for the organization, they are sensitive. They, they sense and smell the trends of the time, which is very important for, for professions in the fashion. So, if there are professions which fit quite well to them, actors, politicians, managers, coaches, leadership, personalities, pastors, sellers, networkers, or in, in, the, in the artistic way, the fashion, the decoration, the architecture, the graphic design, the event manager, or in the idealistic world, when we, when we can do something to the improvement of the world, become missionary, going to the third world. There are some accumulations of histrionic people in, in such professions. But there are very little historic people in, in the profession of accountant, mathematicians, statistics, notarius, cashier, or so. It is too narrow for them. We should think about, we know people who have such traits, we may protect some traits in life. It is important that we come to a reconciliation with these traits. The reconciliation uh, means that I can say, if I or my partner or friend have such a trait, the touch traits, I may have. I may be as I am. This I can work on, or with my friends or partner, we can work on maybe by psychotherapy we can work on. But this is not the important. The important is in our life that we behave in a way that I can stay behind the world. And there are positive aspects of the histrionic that I make use of as much as I can from the positive capacities of the historic impulses, tendencies. But that I try to look at that I can, that I behave, that I integrate these personality traits, and that I'm open to them and try to live in a way that I can say, I do the best of it. A few words on the development of history. Then we come, and we have a few more words on prevention and a few words on the dealing with history. Why 
two people become his friend. There are three main reasons. One reason is this experience of narrowness and pressure, which produces pain. This narrowness and pressure can come from the outside, but also from the inside. It comes from the outside uh, through social, or economic, or psychic, or relational life circumstances. Social marginalization, season workers, pressure, the traditional role of, uh, of women, in some areas, uh, to de when, when people detect that they are homosexual, it, will, it is not accepted in some society. The narrowness of a, of a, vill a little village, the conformity pressure of the group, sexual expectations of the public, this can all exert the pressure and under pressure, and when we live for a long time with such pressure or narrowness in a little bit, everybody sees what we do, what I do. I feel not at ease, I suffer, it's painful. Then this is one basis how it can develop. It, the pressure can be uh, a work from uh, nine to five every day in the same way that I feel it too narrow for me, that I feel unfree. But also from the inside, I myself can exert the pressure on me by expectations I have upon me, by imaginations, uh, by ideas what I should be able to do, or that, what I could, or that, um, what my, my colleagues expect from me by experiencing of uh, weaknesses, by living, by having inner tensions and unresolved conflicts, having uh, tensions uh, of uh, by instinctive uh, drives. By living a life where I cannot stand by myself. All this can produce tension, pressure, and it can be combined with outer uh, elements and inner elements, so that some people have a huge amount of narrowness and tension. This is hysteria, what makes hysteria. The second cause is the being hurt, traumatized. It often happens in the realm of sexuality, because sexuality naturally uh, happens in an intimacy. We are close, and then it is very hurtful. Being hurt by not being seen, by not taken seriously, by being abused or just abused, by violation, also asexual violations, when a person who I don't like hugs me and keeps me hugged and I feel disgust. This person can be the own father or can be a friend. This is gruesome. One feels abused by such experiences. And historic people have a deeply rooted anxiety, fear from uh, pain. They have experienced too much pain. And the third one, the third element for the development of hysteronic behavior is the feeling abandoned in uh, loneliness. The, the experience of loneliness. Loneliness is something painful, but having the feeling of being 
abandoned and therefore lonely is much worse because abandonment means there has been somebody before, there has been a relationship which was given up and it is mostly attributed internally. It is because of you, because I know. And this can happen from the outside, but also from the inside. Historic people behave in a way where they abandon themselves constantly. They behave remote control. They cannot, uh, they, it's their anxiety from heaven that they behave in a way that they uh, cannot withstand to their behavior. They feel fear from, from punishment or from loss of uh, respect or they are too ambitious. There is the fear of rejection. <coughs> we can prevent, we can do something that historic pathology, historic suffering does not come up or can become too strong. One is one element is to keep try to keep, keep closeness to oneself. To um, have an inner dialogue, to ask myself, what do I think, what is going on, to, to pay attention to this. Then we do not have to become so distant, but so direct towards the answer, that when we train ourselves to look at the answer. The second element is to train ourselves to make, to come to position oneself, to um, look at what do I personally think, of, what is my position to, not just follow what is the uh, public opinion or what is fashion, but also to look, also, it's okay to look at it, but also to look, and I personally, what do I think about this behavior from my child, from my partner, from my own behavior? And the third is to train to keep borders, to look at what are new borders. And the fourth is the very central one, to train, to uh, support pain. Pain is not the worst. Pain does not kill you. Pain is something which belongs to you. And if we try to avoid pain, then our life becomes superficial. Pain doesn't take me away the meaning of life. Pain doesn't uh, make me foreign to myself. But when I try to avoid pain at all costs, this makes me foreign to myself. <coughs> now, what can we do? How can we deal with people who are history? These preventive elements are mainly for myself to reduce the risk, to bring me back to, to my center, but with other people. The most important is that um, we adopt an attitude of personal dialogue, that we don't try, to, we, we try to not follow their seduction, their invitation, their dynamic, even their attraction. But 
that we look at ourselves, how do I feel, what is important for me, what do I want to do, what do I want to say, and to implement my own, my values. That what let me do myself. And speak it out. And when I oh, encountered this uh, <coughs> historic behavior of the other, I look at myself again okay, and look at and what is important for me now. And not to wait, but to say it immediately. When I feel that I lose my attention, then I say, sorry, uh, this is, uh, at the moment, I have a difficulty to follow you. You know, uh, you started with something, and at the beginning I thought, this is very good, very important, this is interesting to me. Can you say a bit more about that? And give them a guidance. This is very important in psychotherapy. This is a basic element in the treatment. But we can apply it in our everyday lives. Also, that we guide the hysteric person because they have no guidance in themselves. Their guidance is always directed to just to impress. So we can give them a guidance. And then we can, it's a big effort taking, at least when there is a bit of stronger hysteric behavior in the other. <coughs> We can always bring him or her back to what is interesting for me. Yeah. Because what is interesting for me gives the historic person this orientation what he or she is looking for. And then he doesn't have to, or she doesn't have to imply their behavior. Because they get what they need, and we know about it, and we give it them and don't wait until they start to, to fight for it. Personal encounter, this is the center. When you understand and know what is a personal encounter, personal encounter refers to me as a person. That I, it, this is not egoism. This is absolutely <coughs> needed, especially with historic person. It is always good, but with them it is especially needed to refer to my center and to, to bring into our relationship, into our encounter, in, into this meeting, what is important for me. Most people wait too long. And then they make the most uh, heavy or, or the worst mistake. Which, can ha which happens regularly in dealing with history. We are laughing about them. And we know the way it is to know. They were not authentic. If you are authentic in the presence of a, of a historic person, you don't have to laugh about anything. You can even reach them quite well even stronger hysteronic people. Not taking the other seriously. This is exactly what they, they suffer from. And they experience it again when we are not making use of our own myths, our own center, when we are not offering them our being a person, our authenticity. Then they are lost. And they are so strong that they make us lost again. And then it happens what they feel. It happens again that they are ridiculing, that they are not taken seriously, that the relationships break, etc. So dealing with historic personalities is a very good training to become more myself and to to refer to myself and to do that what they cannot do so good. And this is also good and a good exercise for ourselves. In therapy, we have to consider many more elements. 
the setting and the, and the work on the pain and the biographical work, etc. But, but this goes too far. My idea was to, to give you a view on the, this pain of the human being, which is a very human pain and suffering, which we, with which we all have to deal with during our life, but hopefully are not fixed in a way that we, that we cannot make use of and, and take advantage of when what we get in encounters of other people. To have an understanding for that and to understand a bit how painful it is to live with this experience of narrowness and pressure and, and trauma and pain and this uh, uh, exteriorization which comes up. And then to understand that these young people need me I really am, and that we encourage, we feel encouraged to, to show them, and not to qualify it as to be too egoistic, because this is exactly what they need, me, not my egoism. If I do not show me, then we make them egoistic, and everything turns around them like a tornado, and we are in the midst of a tornado and lose themselves and ourselves. Thank you for your attention. Of bulimia. 
and so on. But also drugs and alcohol, etc. Yeah. But this is a good question. It is surprising that uh, this emptiness is not filled up regularly or mostly by um, addictive behavior. They look for the human being. And their pain is not so prevalent, like, for instance, in, uh, in anxiety or depression or so, because the pain is not. There is a lot of pain, so much pain that they cannot bear it. But it is simply too much, and therefore it is dissociated. It's split away. It, they don't feel it. It's not. And therefore they have the feeling that there is nothing. Because they cannot feel the pain, and therefore they cannot feel themselves. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the statistics uh, are a bit diverging. Um, it seems that there are a bit more histrionic, female histrionic in pathology. But the discussion is that the description of histrionism over centuries was almost mostly done by men. And that this is one source that there are more women diagnosed as history. And the role of the women over the centuries, of course, produced so much narrowness and pressure on women. And they couldn't be so really themselves that this is a, a, histri a historic background which led to a bigger amount of female history. And um, another reason is that um, men uh, make the, mostly the diagnosis, and uh, that men, uh, and the statistics say that in principle it is two to one, the percentage, but with cautious. We must be cautious and we must make new diagnostic systems, but right now, it is not diagnosed at all. And so we have to, to see how it will develop. The um, men seem to be, to, in personality disorders, it's the same discussion. Um, some people say there are more women who are borderline personality disorders. But this is also a question of diagnosis. And there are some more men who are narcissistic. But the female narcissism looks different. And the, the, the diagnostic systems have that type of uh, elements which correspond to more to men. And therefore, we have more men in, in narcissism. But when we try to diagnose the female narcissism, it's also about the same. So, the statistics here are very difficult. The, the description of this picture, the, the, the intent to grasp them statistically <coughs> is very hard. I, I'm convinced it can, gra can be grasped only phenomenologically. And all statistical approach is too superficial for that. Thank you. Maybe one, one last question out of three, and then we're... Yeah. Uh, are there any prevalent comorbidities with histrionic disorders related to the addictions question? Hmm, good question. I am not really aware of special comorbidities. Psychosomatic disorders are quite frequent, but this is, of course, the conversion syndrome. Uh, this is uh, this is one level of symptomatology that the body is mainly uh, or is uh, inflicted to a high degree. But a part of this somatoform, 
because in the diagnostics manuals it's not psychosomatic, it's somatoform, which says nothing. <laughs> it, it says only it has the shape of body. <laughs> what a <the> diagnosis. <laughs> but it's scientific. <laughs> so uh, I hate this type of description which is uh, just fake words. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah. A part of this psychosomatic disorders uh, I would uh, is there anybody who knows more about this? Uh, this I didn't encounter it. It's a medical, I think we're It's a disorder mostly in itself. And it's so interesting for the existential point of view because it describes the development of becoming really myself and how important it is to have a soul, a you, to become me. And when I don't have that, I'm lost. And it's so painful when I'm lost. When I have to live a life without myself, without encountering myself, without being in dialogue with myself, without knowing myself, this is unbearable and they do whatever they can with so much tenacity and power to get more of this. But where are the people who encounter them? Thank you. Thank you very much, I speak for